Welcome to the Connect Your Health to Life coaching podcast. I'm your host, Seth Lusk. I'm a master certified life coach and published author with a decade long background working in the health, wellness, and fitness industry as a personal trainer, nutrition specialist, and life coach. If you're anything like me or the clients that I work with, then you might be struggling with some confidence issues or struggling with feeling like you're not living your most fulfilling or authentic life. You may be trying to figure out why you have these amazing desires for what your most fulfilling life would look like, but you can't seem to create consistent action in your life to reflect those desires. So join me as we dive in deep on what it means to truly live a fulfilled and authentic life from the inside out. We're going to look from the perspective of an empowered mindset and uncover some of the reasons why you might be what's holding yourself back from living that most fulfilling life. But don't worry, this isn't about blame, guilt, or shame. This is about empowering you to see. I'm going to break through some of the biggest illusions and myths that we've all been taught to believe along the way, and I'm so excited to have you with me on this journey. So my only question for you is, are you ready to start living your most fulfilling life once and for all? Then let's get started, shall we? Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. For those of you listening in for the first time, welcome, welcome. You picked an interesting episode to join in on, and I know I say that every week because I mean it every week. This week, I think the episode is going to be particularly useful for people in the 21st century in 2022 because it's something that we hear a lot about, something that we talk a lot about all over the place, and it's sort of... I would say this has even become either a catchphrase or a catch word in um, our generation, this this idea of being triggered. And I want to start off by saying that many times on this podcast, I'm talking with you all about real life struggles that either I, my friends, or my clients have or still are facing. And this week, it's no different. While the topic of this week is something that is pretty much experience, I would say, worldwide. Um, The approach I want to take today is one of which that applies to situations and struggles that I see directly in my political, economic, social circles, on social media, um, and in person with my friends and clients, and from my own experience um, with this topic in my own life. So this week, as I said, we're talking about triggers and believe it or not, um, as, as cut and dry, because we, we talk about this so often, as cut and dry as this topic may feel for us and may feel that our, our grasp on triggers actually is, um, or as cut and dry as the, the self-help industry seems to portray um, triggers being, triggers are quite complicated. They're intricate and they are very individual and authentic to every person experiencing them. There are some universal truths surrounding triggers, of course, but how they apply to each and every one of our own unique lives and our journeys through that life when it comes to how we will develop, experience, face, or ignore, or heal, or avoid those triggers, it's as unique as all 8 billion people on this planet. And that, I know that's a rough estimate. I think we have like almost 8 billion people, or we might be a little bit over 8 billion people. But today... I'm not wanting to give you all a how-to guide when it comes to healing emotional triggers. I'm not wanting to completely generalize this idea of triggers and what everyone needs to do involving triggers. Um, I'm here today to provide awareness and a rough scaffolding scaffolding of, of how we can begin to dismantle this disempowered illusion that sort of the self-help industry and our our social structures are teaching us when it comes to how we look at triggers and how we face our triggers. And I want to begin to show you all today how the way we've been taught to look at triggers is and believe in triggers is, is sort of disempowering us. And today I want to bring awareness to what our triggers truly are and how we can begin to or that we can begin to re-empower ourselves and our experience of being a human being living with this experience that we call triggers in our journey through this life. So I think it's important as usual that we start off by defining what a trigger is when it comes to today's discussion. Many of us know what a trigger is on a gun, probably, or on a weapon of some sort. We know what a trigger is maybe with some tools for building or demolishing objects. But today, what we're going to be talking about when we talk about triggers 
is the triggers that we as humans can develop in our experience of life. And I call them emotional triggers. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is emotional triggers. And some of these emotional triggers end up triggering some very physical reactions within our body. And as adults, we experience these triggers more and more if we don't take the empowered actions to heal what's behind the trigger and to move into the trigger versus trying to resist it or avoid it or get away from it. And these physical reactions in the body can become more and more reinforced and we, be- and we can become victims or even feel like prisoners to our own triggers. So a trigger in the context of, of how we're talking about it today, it can be defined as the cause of of an event or situation to happen or exist. Or it can be defined as read, seen, or heard distress that arouses memories associated with a traumatic event. This is what we call emotional triggering. And you might be wondering why I call it that, or people call it that when in the definition it mentions memories. So why don't we call them, I don't know, memory triggers? So memories are not an actual thing, and and that's the reason why I call it emotional triggers. Memories are thoughts in our head. They no longer exist except as a story that we tell ourselves. Emotions come from thoughts in our head as well. Some of these thoughts are more conscious than others, but they come from thoughts. So the reason I call these emotional triggers is because that is exactly what they are. We are experiencing something in the present, and the brain associates it with thoughts and a story we have created in our brain of a past event that we have strong feelings about from strong thoughts that we had at the time of the event that our brain memorialized it. And in the current moment, we're experiencing something else, and we experience the influx of intense emotions associated with that memory slash story that we are replaying in association with what is currently happening happening in our life. This is an emotional trigger. Now, it's important that we see this for a few reasons. Because in our current social culture, we are taught such a disempowered way to view triggers. We have this trigger culture that promotes this idea that triggers are caused by situations or people doing certain things to us or around us. The current approach to this is is quite disempowered as well. The options that I currently see being promoted when dealing with quote unquote being triggered are the following. And and I'm sure that there are more, but these are the ones that I, I see more frequently. So option number one is you can avoid the situation or situations similar to the one in which you felt triggered. And I'm I want to emphasize that word felt. Okay? You can avoid situations in which there are situations that are similar to the ones where you felt triggered. The other option is you can block people from your life or quote unquote types of people. And I'm putting big air marks around that because there's no such thing as a type of person. Okay? Um, You can block people from your life that were present or taking actions in the situation in which you felt triggered. And notice how I worded this here. I didn't say that the person that triggered you um, is being blocked. I am saying this with intention. I'm saying people that were present and taking action in that situation. I'm saying this because this idea that another person triggers you is part of the disempowered approach. And one approach to that is to block people from your life that were taking certain actions in a situation in which you felt triggered. Another approach is to attempt to shame the situation or the person in the situation in which you felt triggered, and then attempt to manipulate an apology from them in which somehow um, you hope to feel better about being triggered, which in the end itself is, is also so disempowering because we're waiting on the other person's apology in order to make us feel something. So we're, again, waiting on someone else to make us feel something. And I've talked about this with you all a thousand times before. Other people don't make us feel anything. Our own thoughts and beliefs about situations and other people are what make us feel what we feel. The other approach is to try and go about getting rid of types of situations in the social environment around you. Think things like cancel culture or 
um, this, I, I, I see people saying this all the time, let's stop normalizing. And then there's some sort of blanket statement in which we attempt to get mass numbers of people to agree with our trigger points and agree to behave in a way to get rid of the behaviors or the situations or the quote unquote types of people in our society to avoid the feeling of being triggered. Triggers are basically situations in our current life that the brain sees and associates with a memory or a story that it has about a past situation that it finds similar to the current situation. And in this, we need to keep in mind two big factors that I've spoken about before, that when we put these into perspective when we talk about triggers, we have the opportunity to re-empower ourselves when it comes to our emotional triggers. The first one being our brain's negativity bias. The second being how the brain experiences and interprets reality. So let's talk about the negativity bias first. And by the way, there are other factors involved here, but these are the two big ones and what we have time to sort of go through today. So I I picked these two because they're the two biggest ones, I think, for us to look at when it comes to triggers um, and, and what I could fit in today's episode. So the negativity bias. Basically, what you need to know is the brain is always running a program in the background that I call what's wrong here. Um, The brain developed this program or this sort of software to attempt to be proactive in avoiding danger. Instead of waiting for actual danger to our lives to actually happen, the brain developed a way to sort of proactively avoid this because the brain doesn't trust that in the moment if we were to experience danger to life situations, that we would be able to respond maybe fast enough or to, to, to remove the danger of the situation or to remove ourselves safely from the danger of the situation. So in other words, basically before something is actually going to kill us or trying to kill us or eat us, it's sort of the brain's way to recognize situations in which that might occur more easily and to stay away from them to avoid a situation in which we might actually be in danger of being killed or eaten and then possibly not being able to react effectively or quickly enough in that moment to avoid the injury or death that could occur. So the brain does this constantly. It is what we call the brain's negativity bias. It is mostly subconscious. And basically, the brain's just going around looking for what's wrong here, what's wrong here, what do I need to avoid, what do I need to stay away from in order to stay safe and to stay alive. It's mostly subconscious, but other times we can be very conscious of its presence in our thinking and therefore our actions. So that being said, triggers. The brain takes an event that happened in which the brain interpreted danger. And it forms a story about that situation. It forms opinions about the quote-unquote danger of that situation. And it formulates signals to let it know to bring up that memory again and the feelings associated with that memory again that the brain interpreted into the story of that memory of interpreted danger to remind us of the potential danger of that interpreted situation. Sounds really complicated. So basically, our brain looks for cues of possibility that this situation might happen again and how to avoid it or in order to avoid it. Sometimes these cues are quite accurate in predicting the reoccurrence of similar events. Think things like dropping a hot pan while cooking and it lands on your foot and burns it. Well, the next time while you're cooking, if you even feel yourself almost dropping the pan, guess what you're going to do? You might jump. Even if the pan would not have actually landed on your foot in the current situation, you jump backwards to avoid being burned by the pan again. This is a very helpful and accurate prediction for the most part. Now, sometimes there can be overreactions, but it's it's a helpful reaction because it keeps us from experiencing the damage to our body and the pain of being burnt. Now, where this gets muddy and really messy and very disempowering, and where I want to talk about this today the most is when we involve other people. You see, we take memories of how other people behave and our interpretation of that behavior and our interpretation of what that behavior means 
And therefore, what we feel about that behavior, and then we extrapolate that upon the current situations, and the brain begins to think that it can predict not only what other people are about to do, but what they are thinking and meaning and feeling, and therefore how we're going to feel and what we're going to have to think about that situation, all in the attempt to avoid a different kind of pain this time, not physical, but emotional pain. So the brain tries to make these same predictions because to your brain, emotional pain is the same as physical pain. And actually, even physical pain is emotional pain in a way because pain occurs in the brain, not in the body. We have stimulus that occurs in the body, and then the brain interprets it as pain. Okay, that's why that's actually how pain medication works. It doesn't actually stop the pain or stop the pain signal. It actually just alters the way the brain interprets the signal so that it doesn't interpret it as pain. So we change the way the brain interprets the signal, but the pain is actually still there. And we've talked about that all before. If you want to go back to my three-part series in the podcast episode where I talk about emotional pain, that would be maybe very helpful for you to understand in, in this situation what we're going to be talking about here. So our brain also tries to avoid emotional pain, and we do it sometimes with people by thinking that we can predict what people are about to do, what, they, what they're thinking, what they're meaning, what they're going to say, and what they mean by that, all through our previous interpretations of situations where someone said something and we made it mean something and we felt something about that and we want to avoid that feeling again, so the brain tries to interpret this and tries to put this onto situations in order to avoid that emotional trigger. Now, this is not to say that we do not ever experience emotional pain alongside physically painful situations either, because often we do. But today, what I want to talk about is these emotional pain triggers and and the brain's attempt to predict the quote-unquote danger of emotional pain, which in and of itself is a very disempowering view to have, to consider emotional pain to be dangerous or harmful or to be avoided, because emotional pain is part of the human experience. And us seeing it as being problematic is what makes it problematic. It's not that emotional pain is bad or a problem until we teach ourselves to see it as being a problem. Um, And then the, so our brain goes about trying to attempt to predict this, this danger of emotional pain and therefore reactions to situations in our current life that are actually stemming from previous situations where we interpreted emotional trauma onto ourselves. Okay? So... And, and again, I don't want you all to think that I am, I want to preface all of this by saying, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later, I'm not trying to diminish emotional trauma or say that it doesn't exist or that, you know, we we don't want it to happen, you know, like things, think, you know, emotional abuse that, that parents can intentionally inflict upon their children to try and manipulate situations. That's not what I'm trying to talk about here or what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to say this doesn't exist and that we we shouldn't want to stop the cycle of intentionally trying to create emotional trauma and trying to emotionally manipulate. But what I'm trying to talk about here is the fact that emotional trauma is something we actually create for ourselves. No one can make us experience emotional trauma. We have to interpret that into the situation. And that doesn't mean that it's not very easy to interpret it into situations, especially when we're children and we don't understand what's going on and we don't have the emotional tools necessary to interpret the situations in a way that empowers us and in a way where we understand that we are interpreting this into the situation. So going back to emotional trauma... And going back to the, these reactions to current situations that actually stem from previous emotional trauma. So let's think of a situation like this when it comes to how negativity bias applies here. So when you imagine when you were six years old and you went to school for the first day of class. Your mom drops you off. You walk in the classroom. There is a group of kids you do not know there. And they all stare at you as you walk in the room. Your brain gets to work wondering what they might be thinking about you as you are thinking about them. And we could even probably go further back to another event that may have happened when you were one or two years old that is the reason why your brain is wondering and worrying about what these people might think about you. But let's start at six years old. 
All right, so you're wondering how they are feeling. Is it the same feelings you're having? You don't know what is about to happen. So maybe you feel scared. You feel uncertain. Maybe you feel excited. Maybe you feel anxious. So your mom or your dad leaves you there and you're in this room full of kids. And the teacher walks up to you and says hello and asks you for your name to introduce you to the class. You say your name to the teacher and the teacher tells the class. And someone in the class starts laughing and comments about how stupid your name is and laughs. Then everyone starts laughing. Now your brain goes about making an interpretation of this event that means something about you and your name and how acceptable your name is and, you know, something about your name and you and how wanted you are and how unwanted you are. So you begin crying and you try to run away, but the teacher stops you. The class continues to laugh. Your brain makes a memory of this. You never fully look at those emotions here. You're told to brush it off. That's just how school is. You can get over it. Come on, let's just keep going throughout the day. You know, you'll be fine. Okay, fast forward 30 years later, and you've just been hired at a job. You have an orientation class to attend. You arrive, and you leave that familiar space of your car, and you walk into a new building. And you walk into a room full of people you've never met. They're all staring at you as you walk in. You know this feeling. You recognize something playing in the background saying, I don't know, you can't hear the words, but you have this feeling of be careful here. Something can go wrong. Maybe something is wrong. You can't put a finger on what it is exactly. The person in charge of the orientation class walks in and introduces himself and says that the first activity you will be doing today is an introduction activity where you will tell everyone your name, where you're from, one of your hobbies, and an interesting fact about you. So everyone goes around the room and you feel the tension building in your head and in your body. It comes to your turn and everyone is looking right at you. You look across the room, there are two people, a guy, a girl, two guys, two girls, to people, however you want it. There are just two people over there and they're whispering something to one another. You feel your face flush. You have no idea what the two people are talking about that are looking at you from across the room. You have no idea that the two people looking at you from across the room are best friends applying for this job together. One of them thinks you're very attractive, but you do know that they're looking at you and they're whispering at one another, but you don't know what they're whispering about. You don't know anything about their situation. You stand up in front and you introduce yourself and you say your name. And as you do, these two turn and look at each other and a big grin shows on their face. It's actually because you have the same name as the ex of one of theirs that, that finds you attractive. And they find it a bit ironic that they find you attractive and you have the same name as their ex. And all you see is the shit-eating grin that they have on their face. You panic. You don't know why. Your eyes start to tear up. You don't know why. You feel embarrassed. You want to run out of the room. And so you go to run out of the room. You, my friends, have experienced an emotional trigger here. One in which negativity bias played a huge role because your brain was looking for something is wrong here. We need to avoid something here. Okay? That's how negativity bias plays in here. Now, I also mentioned earlier that there are two big factors that play into, the, into these triggers. And many more actually exist, but the two factors that I want to focus on today, like I said, were the negativity bias. And the next one is the brain and how it interprets experience of life. And I've talked about this in more depth in last week and the week before. So this week, I'm only going to give a super brief summary here. So if you if you haven't listened to last week's episode or the week before, because the week before last week, I went into even more depth about this. I want you to go back and listen to those two episodes because this will help you understand what I'm talking about here. So I'm just going to give a very brief summary here. Um, and if you want to hear more, go back and listen to the last two weeks' episodes. So basically, at any at any given time, we have billions upon 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 billions, and I could keep saying that probably for the next five minutes and not even come close, pieces of stimulus, data, and information available that make up what is actually reality, okay? So let's bring that down to one billion. 
for the sake of just trying to grasp the vastness of reality here. Let's take that massive number and let's just bring it down to 1 billion, which is already a massive number. Most people don't understand how big the number 1 billion is. It's huge. But let's bring the actual reality down to 1 billion pieces of information, stimulus and data for the sake of trying to grasp what we're talking about here. So when we reduce this down to 1 billion, which is already about 1% or less of the actual data that makes up reality, in this situation, this made-up scenario of only 1 billion pieces of data, stimulus, and information actually existing, out of this 1 billion, the body is able to experience about 11 million pieces of this information, data, or stimulus from moment to moment. And in actual reality, where it's billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions and so forth, it's still only 11 million pieces of information from moment to moment that our body is able to actually experience and bring into itself for interpretation. Okay, and with this experience, it sends this information to the brain to be experienced, examined, and interpreted. And out of this 11 million pieces of information that the body is taking in, and experiencing a stimulus at all points in time, the brain goes through a series of processes based in our past experience, in its negativity bias, and our biological needs for food, survival, safety, etc., and it narrows that amount of information down to a number that it can handle to consciously process from moment to moment. And that number is estimated now by scientists and psychologists to be around 40 to 60 pieces of information. Think about that. 40 to 60 pieces of information out of billions upon 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 billions and so forth of pieces of information. Okay, so you consciously process about 40 to 60 pieces of information from moment to moment that make up your conscious experience of life. And this conscious experience is what creates the ideas, thoughts, and beliefs about the world and what it means to you. As well as, with these 40 to 60 pieces of information from moment to moment, we create memories or stories about our conscious experience of reality to use later to help the brain make its decisions about which 40 to 60 pieces of information per moment to process and focus on to make our current and future experiences and memories from it. I want you to think about that there. This is 40 to 60 pieces of information out of the, the vast amount that actually exists in this made-up scenario where we've narrowed it down to 1 billion pieces of information. This 40 to 60 pieces of information only makes up 0.00000000004% of reality. And that's in the made-up scenario where we've already reduced reality to less than 1% of actual reality. Think about that. Why is this important here? Because we have the brain's negativity bias. Then we have conscious experience telling the brain what pieces of information to look for in reality to consciously interpret to play into that negativity bias and try to avoid danger. And this makes up how we experience life. This is important to see here because so many times we treat our memories that we then use to influence how we're going to interpret current situations. We treat those memories, those stories, as facts. We treat our current experience of life as if it's fact. And what I want you to see here is that our experience of reality is limited and isn't the full experience of reality. And that's not to diminish our experience of reality and say it's completely untrue, but it is only 0.000000004% of the full experience of reality. And that's in the made-up scenario where reality is only 1 billion pieces of information. So it's actually even less than that. So what I want you to understand is that your interpretation of reality, the, the ways that you are boxing yourself in in life and how you interpret life and what it means, are based on such a tiny fraction of all of the information that fully exists. 
and we box ourselves into these limited possibilities and experiences of life and treat them as if they are facts and we we narrow down our lives and limit our lives even further and play small based on these tiny already experiences when there's so much more out there possible for us and available for us to look at in different ways. And just to look at it all because we haven't looked at it before because we didn't even see it because of the lenses that we're looking at life through. We are taught to look at our emotional triggers as if something outside of us that is factual is causing them and that we need to stop those factual causes out there from happening. And the reality is that triggers are internally created and brought up. We are also taught to see triggers and the memories that we formed to create them as being these unalterable facts about our experience of life and just how our life has to be and has been. And what I want to get you to see is that all of this is able, it's within your power to interpret. It it was interpreted by you and therefore you have the option to reinterpret it in so many different ways that could re-empower you. But you're stuck believing that in order to heal or get rid of or avoid or whatever with these triggers, you've got to be out there trying to change these quote-unquote factual experiences of life and reality. And these beliefs right here create such a disempowered illusion in how we approach our triggers in our lives as adults with the powers of emotional responsibility, sovereignty, and creation within our lives. We're taught to ignore all of that and become completely disempowered with these illusions of our triggers. So let's go back and look at some of the current approaches to being triggered. Every single one that I mentioned earlier has to do with avoidance, avoiding situations or similar situations to the one in which we felt triggered, blocking people out of your life, that were maybe present in a moment where you felt triggered. Labeling people as being certain types of people and trying to block whole entire types of people or types of situations from your life in order to not feel triggered. Feeling like we have to change social norms and change the agreed upon social norms in order to not feel triggered. When we put these approaches through the lens that we've just talked about here, it puts us in a very disempowered position in our life. One in which we hide in fear and we avoid whole entire parts of reality. We're already only experiencing such a tiny amount of it. And then we're teaching ourselves to avoid whole entire other sections of it because we don't see that it's our interpretation of it that we are afraid of. And in doing so, we avoid whole entire parts of reality and therefore possibility for ourselves. Remember that the situation, the person, the quote-unquote type of person, is not the trigger. The trigger is an interpretation of an old situation being used in comparison to the interpretation of the new situation in the brain's attempt to use its negativity bias to avoid danger. And we can see in situations like dropping a hot pan to, and moving our feet away, it can prove to be useful. But in the situation of, of the job orientation, running from a situation in which you interpret a meaning about your acceptability and what people might think of you, well, guess what? It doesn't actually help you. It's causing you to run from situations of opportunity in your life. And not just that, the pieces of information that you used to interpret your reality in both the original memory and the current situation are limited. It's not even all of the truth. It's not even all of the reality. Remember that. So you're choosing to see danger in the form of your value, your worth, your acceptability, your lovability, and seeing that as being in question based in, on the interpretation of reality that consists of 0.0000000004% of actual reality. So in the original memory, let's go back. The kid who laughed. Let's look at just a little bit more of the possible reality there. Okay, so the kid who laughed at you, he grew up in a very conservative family, but you don't know this. 
A conservative family who only ever experienced life within a 100 mile radius, with one religion, one political view, a very narrow list of possible fields of employment that were ever talked about as being appropriate or possible for members of their family and people like them, quote unquote, as well as a narrow limited view on acceptable behaviors, music to listen to, clothes to wear, foods to eat, etc. His family doesn't talk about emotions because both of his parents were taught to avoid emotions and just to try and be happy all the time, which is not reality. So his parents developed the strategy strategy to fake happiness in situations in which other emotions they did not want to feel or, or didn't feel comfortable expressing come up, and this strategy is to laugh, make a joke about it. When afraid, when confused, when annoyed, when uncertain, just make a joke about it and laugh. So this boy in your class was laughing when he heard your name because he is in a room full of kids who he did not know. They were wearing clothes he's never seen before, doing things he was taught not to do, and saying things in ways He's never heard things said before and maybe was taught is inappropriate to say. Your name is a name he's never heard before. He's uncomfortable at this point in time. He's uncertain. He's confused. He's scared. He wants to cry because he doesn't know, is he abnormal? But that is not how he's taught to act. Not to cry. No, you laugh. So this boy makes a joke about your name to take the attention away from how uncomfortable and scared he felt by experiencing more of the familiar stimulus of making a joke and laughing. He was experiencing too much unfamiliar stimulus, and he was not emotionally equipped to handle that. And his trained response was to make a joke and laugh, thereby avoiding his emotional experience. It wasn't even actually about you. But you don't know any of this, of course. It's not part of the 40 to 60 pieces of information that your brain interpreted in that situation. How could it have been? But what you do know is that your parents told you that you're different. You know what the religion you practice is and where you come from and what you look like and that it's different from most of the people in the area where you're in school. You were taught as a kid to try and fit in as much as possible to avoid being a social outcast and that this is the most in important thing to ensure your survival in the place where you live. This means that what you interpret this laughter about your name to mean is that you are in danger of being a social outcast and that you might not survive this experience of school. Fast forward this interpretation that you have remained unaware of and held onto and bring it into adulthood. You face the situation of this new job orientation. You have your old memory that is a limited, subjective interpretation of reality, and you are still using it to be a lens through which you experience your current reality and help your brain choose which 40 to, piece, 40 to 60 pieces of information it will take in to interpret. So this orientation becomes an event in which you feel emotionally triggered based in the 40 to 60 pieces of information that your brain consciously experiences in the current situation that were selected based on the lens of the old limited experience interpretation. Do you begin to see here, first of all, how triggers are not facts that we experience? And second of all, that we can so easily, without any awareness, become so disempowered and victims within our own lives to our own emotional triggers if we do not purposefully choose to become aware of them, choose to understand them and what they actually are, and then choose to heal the wounding surrounding these emotional triggers once we understand that the wounding was based in a subjective interpretation, not an objective observation of reality. So this approach of avoidance, of blocking things out, blocking situations, blocking people out, trying to convince society to agree with us. It does not do anything to help us other than to reinforce the subjective experience of this trigger and to create more evidence that it is objectively true when it is not. And it reinforces the idea that we are victims to these situations happening, quote unquote, to us or against us, and that we quote-unquote have to experience them in this way. So the only thing left is that we have to avoid it. But the more we avoid them, the more the brain is being taught to limit what experiences are safe, and then passes this through its negativity bias of how it will see and experience more and different situations in the future. So you will continually keep finding evidence of more and more types of situations in the future to quote unquote have to avoid in order to avoid the experience of your emotional trigger. But the emotional trigger is happening not because of the situation. So you are avoiding whole entire portions of actual reality 
and limiting what is possible for you in an attempt to avoid something that you are the one that is actually creating to begin with. And you will do this until your life becomes so small, so avoidant, and so fearful that you have placed yourself inside this tiny prisoned box to try and avoid triggers, only to find that within that box is the true source of the triggers. And that's you. And this is not about blame. This is not about guilt or shame. But when we do this, this leads to a whole different set of dysfunctional behaviors. If you are not aware of your power to do something about these triggers and use them for you and to compassionately see why you created them to begin with, then when you've trapped yourself in this box with yourself and you're the source of the triggers, the dysfunction just elevates. It doesn't save you. It doesn't help you. All you've done is limited your life to you and the triggers that you've created for yourself. This applies to all of the approaches that we mentioned earlier. When we talk about blocking people or situations from your life, shaming people in order to get an apology, trying to convince society or other groups of people to change so you can feel more comfortable. All of these approaches put the power and source of your triggers somewhere it doesn't actually exist. And it puts you in a place where you are disempowered and trapping yourself in a box and shrinking the possibilities of your own life out of fear of experiencing something that you're creating. A subjective experience and then a story of that subjective experience that has been memorialized within your brain that you created and therefore have the power to look at and change. Not out of avoidance of experiencing discomfort, but in order to open up opportunity for yourself. So my friends, I know this is a lot to take in here. And I could keep diving deeper and deeper here, but let's come back to the surface for some air and some perspective of why knowing all of this can begin to re-empower you and help you in your own life. This isn't about dismissing or diminishing the human experience. Remember, I said that to begin with and I'm saying it again now. This is not about shaming or guilting ourselves or others for those experiences or for having emotional triggers within ourselves. Or within our experience, this is about expansion and opening ourselves up to possibility here. This is about opening ourselves to our true authentic paths of possibility and opportunity that are based in our true values, sensitivities, and desires in life once we see triggers for what they truly are. You see, when we begin to see that our triggers are truly ours, your triggers are yours, my triggers are mine, we get a power back. We can see why we created those triggers to begin with. We have the opportunity available to us that we had closed to ourselves before. When I began to see in my own life all of the places in which I felt triggered, but what I was doing was I was taking the approach of shaming people, shaming situations, blocking people or situations, avoiding people or situations to try and solve for my triggers, I noticed how small and limited my life felt. What was possible for me felt so small. Because of all of the excuses I was creating based in the fears of avoiding my triggers, I began to see that I was basically trapping myself in. And what was more crazy about it is that I began to see that I was trapping myself in with the very thing I thought I was avoiding. I was barricading myself in with the very thing I thought my barricades were keeping out. I thought I was avoiding certain emotional experiences that I thought I couldn't handle. But I I didn't even know that my emotional experiences were entirely mine. I got to choose them. And avoiding emotional experiences because they feel uncomfortable to me doesn't allow me to see why I'm choosing that current emotional experience. And the more I was able to look at this and I was able to apply compassion and apply openness to understanding why I had begun to do this to begin with and to see that my reality was actually so limited And that this is not something to be afraid of or ashamed of seeing. The the more I did this, the more I opened myself up to see this. The more I saw that I had power to do something different. I had so much potential and possibility available to me that I was afraid to see before. I could begin to see that the boundaries that I thought limited what was possible for me were fully self-imposed. I had 
great reasons, of course, for why I placed those boundaries there. But they were based in one, one interpretation of billions upon billions upon billions upon billions of possible interpretations of my experience of the vastness of reality. And as I felt the fear of that vastness of reality and felt myself wanting to shrink back into that small barricaded box again, I recognized right there, right there is where I have my power. The power of choice. What if I didn't avoid that fear? What if I didn't shrink? What if I leaned into that and said, yes, I'm here for you. Show me. And I got curious about it. What if I asked questions to it about why am I choosing this interpretation to be my actual reality? And what might happen if I looked at the vastness of what reality could be and I looked for different possible interpretations? As I did this, I felt power opening up inside of me that I didn't even realize was there before. Potential opening up that I never allowed myself to believe could be there. I started wanting to come face to face with my triggers and see them. Because I noticed how much of an empowered experience that was for me. Because every time I faced a trigger was an opportunity for me to see why I wanted to limit myself. What was I afraid of? What were the other potentials that existed there that I was avoiding in this fear? I felt myself getting curious about what I could do if I chose chose my triggers in a patient, compassionate, and curious way instead of avoiding them. And as I did this, I slowly started seeing windows where I saw walls. I started seeing doorknobs on those walls where I thought it was just a wall. I started finding keys in my hands to locks that I thought someone else had locked. And as I look around today at our cultures and behaviors surrounding being triggered, I see so many people stuck in this illusion of disempowerment and fear and victimhood and helplessness. And as a coach, I feel this pull to expand and expand my experience and therefore my message and beliefs about what these triggers are and what we can do with them. And today, that is exactly what I wanted to take the time to do with this episode. I want you all to hear me when I tell you that that approaching your triggers from this perspective of expecting situations around you to change or the perspective of avoiding certain situations or people as being your approach to handle your triggers, it puts you in a place of perpetual victimhood to them. It gives them power and creates a life in which you box yourself in with the only source of these triggers and where they began with. And I want you all to begin to see that within that box, you have the power to do something, but you don't have to make your life so small to see that. And I want you all to begin to see that triggers are not something we have to begrudgingly deal with as humans. They are a beautiful part of the human experience that makes it rich and full of possibilities for growth and creating. Sometimes we want to experience what feels like a limit to know that it is there. And then we choose to see the subjectivity of it. Of it and when we do, we get to see that that is a limit that we have put there, and it is only within our own making. And in doing so, we get to open our own eyes and the eyes of collective humanity to begin to see the beautiful vastness of what is possible, that we have the opportunity to be present and participate in that uncovering and creation. Triggers are not something we have to deal with. They are a reminder for us that we have a power and opportunity to release thoughts and beliefs that we were holding on to that have been creating limitations for us, creating damage for us emotionally, spiritually, and even physically. When we choose this path of seeing that, we get to uncover more of who we truly are and what we are here to create in this life. My friends, I want for you to take away from today that triggers do not need to be this reactive, begrudging experience. They do not need to be this disempowered experience of avoiding and shrinking our lives. Triggers are something that we are designed as humans to create within ourselves and then grow through learning to release them as we evolve into truer, fuller versions of who we are actually are beyond that illusion that we were believing and which we created the triggers to begin with. 
And in doing so, we gain a deeper understanding of our unconditional worth and lovability. Triggers are not something we want to avoid. Triggers are not something we want to rid the human experience of. Triggers are a beautiful part of the human design and part of the human life experience. We get to choose if we resist and react or if we lean in and respond with truth, compassion, curiosity, and empowerment. And that's what I want you to see today, my friends. The only question is, are you willing to choose to see your triggers in a way that empowers you? Or do you want to continue to choose the path of seeing your triggers as something that you have to react to and feel disempowered in, quote unquote, having to deal with them? The choice there is 1000% yours. And I'm here to show you that you can, in an empowered way, Use your triggers to show up and express your truest self with more compassion, more love, more acceptance, and intention. And do it in a way that is so authentic for you. That's all I have for you all today, my friends. And I know it was a lot, maybe complicated and confusing feeling for some of you. Go back and listen again. Take notes. Listen again. Reach out if you have questions. I hope this is a bit confusing for you all because it should be. It should be confusing. It's a lot to take in all at once, and most of us have been taught to look at our triggers in such a disempowered way. Of course this feels confusing. If it feels confusing, that means that you are in that belief of that disempowered approach to your triggers. And that means right now, my friends, you have a massive potential to change your effing life by changing the way you look at your triggers. So if this is confusing for you, my friends, (laughs) you are in a place of huge potential. Just reach out. That's all you have to do. Reach out and let's start working through your triggers. I'm here to help you find your answers to your questions. I'm here to find help you find your way into your triggers to see where they truly came from, why you created them, and what you can do with them to start showing up as the true badass that you are in your life that is 1,000% unconditionally worthy of love and acceptance. All right, my friends. So that's all I have for you today. What I want is to see a world full of people who are triggered, but empowered in that experience. I wish that for all of you in the most beautiful way. Have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you here again next week. Ciao. Hey, thank you for listening in this week. I hope you enjoyed the content of this episode. If you did, please subscribe or follow this podcast to receive the newest episodes every week as I bring them to you here on the Connect Your Health to Life coaching channel. Ratings, reviews, and comments are always appreciated. These allow me to know more of what my listeners would like in the podcast and allow for more people who may be searching for a podcast just like this one to find the Connect Your Health to Life coaching channel. If you would like more information about me and the work that I do with my clients one-on-one, then please visit my website at www.slch.ch. Again, that is www.slch.ch. You can also find me on social media on Instagram at sethlusk underscore coaching. Again, that is sethlusk underscore coaching. And on Facebook in my free Facebook group community called A Healthy Life Connection. We would love to have you in the group, and it's only three membership questions that you have to answer to join. And again, it's entirely free. And if you need any further information or just want to say hello, feel free to send me an email directly at slusk.health at slch.ch. Again, that is slusk.health at slch.ch. Thank you again so much for listening, and I look forward to our next time together. Ciao.